Hello and a very warm welcome indeed to this latest edition of Quadriga coming to you from the heart of the German capital Berlin and this week we are focusing on the political crisis in Austria and the impact that it's having on the rest of Europe. Now, the story is this. Austria goes to the polls this weekend to elect a new president. The likely winner is Norbert Hofer, the head of the far-right Freedom Party, who won the first round of voting in April. Since then, there's been much talk of the demise of Austria's post-war political establishment and big questions about how developments in Austria fit into the rise of nationalism and xenophobia that we're currently seeing across the European continent. So our question this week here on Quadriga is this. Crisis in Austria, who can stop Europe's drift to the right? And to discuss that question, I'm joined here in the studio by three seasoned uh, observers and analysts. Let me introduce them to you, beginning with Ewald Koenig, a freelance correspondent and an Austrian himself, who's been covering Austrian politics for decades now. He says, it's not only the refugees, there are many other reasons for Austria's and Europe's drift to the right. Also with us today is Alan Posner, a commentator for the Berlin Daily Die Welt. Alan says nobody cares who governs a small country like Austria, but Germany has a responsibility for the whole of Europe. We can't afford Viennese coffeehouse politics, he says. And my third guest is Ulrike Guerrero of the European Democracy Lab, who believes that a wildfire is sweeping across Europe. It's taken in Hungary and Poland and now Austria, with France looking likely to be next. Ivan Koenig, I'd like to begin with you. And uh, without any disrespect whatsoever, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, suggest that Austria is not exactly a big country. It has a population of fewer than 10 million. I'd like to uh, ask you to explain to us how and why it is having such a huge impact at this point in time. Well, uh, we have a long uh, series of uh, grand coalition in Austria. So therefore I said this is not only the refugees and uh, my mass migration, um, that uh, we have the drift to the um, right wing, but also uh, that people are not satisfied. They are fed up of this um, political system uh, with the two bigger parties, uh, which are not big anymore, and with the wheeling and dealing and um, that they are fed up with many other things, beginning from the globalization uh, down to this uh, interior politics. Okay, you've touched on just about every subject that we're going to be talking about in the next 25 minutes or so. Uh, I'd just like to ask you to give us, a, give us an idea from the people that you've been talking to in Austria this last week or so. What, how great is the sense of crisis in the country ahead of the, this crucial election on Sunday, especially with the world looking on, of course? Well, um, I think many people hope that uh, the candidate of the Green Party Officially, he's independent, but he was uh, chairman of the Green Party for many years, uh, that he will make the election, although uh, there is a big gap between the first candidate of this uh, FPÖ, of this so-called Blue Party. Um, I can imagine that um, many people in Austria were so frustrated that they wanted to protest with the election, and they voted for Hofer, for mm. Norbert Hofer, mm. and then uh, they were shocked about his high percentage uh, in, the, in the result. And uh, now maybe uh, they do not vote uh, in, in this um, uh, big uh, mass and uh, that all the, uh, all the other candidates who failed um, are in favor of, uh, of Mr. van der Bellen. Okay. Although Mr. van der Bellen is uh, not the ideal candidate as well. <laughs> a couple of days ago, there was a, a talk show in, in, the, in the television, private television mm -hmm. in Austria, mm -hmm. and um, it was embarrassing. It was done without the moderator, yeah. just the two candidates. It, it really was embarrassing. It, it's mm -hmm. a damage uh, for, the, mm -hmm. uh, for this uh, presidential uh, function. Okay. 
Ewald Koenig there, Alan Posner, playing down fears in Austria. And you, uh, you've dismissed events in Austria as the politics of a Viennese coffee house. But I'd like to draw your attention to an article that I was reading in the New York Times, published just about a week or so ago, uh, under the title Austria and the Future of Europe. It said, history's shadow of rabid nationalism and xenophobia kept at bay since the end of World War II is lengthening across the continent. This is serious. Oh, yeah, well, of course, it's, uh, it's very serious. And um, New York Times needn't look to Europe to say that. It's lengthening across America, too. We have with Mr. Trump as a presidential candidate of the Republican Party. It's a mm. world, it's a Western phenomenon. No longer can the Americans say um, it's a European phenomenon. When I said it's Viennese cafe, coffee house politics, I was being just as disdainful and, and actually wrong headed about it, of course, because it is a German phenomenon with the RFD <clears throat> uh, uh, too. And, and the, the point is that you talk about dissatisfaction, Mr. Koenig, and, and, and with, with the system in Austria. I go to Austria regularly. It's a great country to live. It's a high standard of living. The, um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. And where does all this anger come from? It's a strange, uh, I don't know, um, it's not as if people are, you know, like in the 30s, out of work, bread lines, you know, even people who are out of work have a great social system in Austria. There's, a, there's something more sinister going on, a, a sort of almost like a death wish. I mean, it's no, maybe it is no accident that Sigmund Freud, who discovered the death wish, comes from, comes from Vienna, as if they want to just destroy everything that these, that, that, European democracy, Austrian democracy, built after the war, and it's very disconcerting because if you could point to something and say it's this, they 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 let uh, let people down on that, then you could change it. But if people seem hell bent on just destroying themselves, um, what do you do? What do you make of all that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated to hear what you have to say now. <laughs> well, what am I doing with the death wish? I, uh, let's take Freud out of here and do politics. Um, I would argue that it doesn't fall from heaven. Uh, first, because there is a, a sort of 15-year-old tradition with Jörg Haider and another very prominent figure, which basically was the uprisal of modern right-wing populism, yeah. which came from Austria 15 years ago, yeah. and which we by then still pursued on the legal side on the, of the European Union because we declenched Article 7 and we wanted to do something against. Um, there's also called Waldheim. I mean, there is, there is something in Austria which seems to be a little bit this hasn't specific. This has come out of yeah? nowhere. Okay. No. So, so it doesn't come from nowhere. There is sort of an... Uh, but it has been undercover for long, yeah? And now I think in the whole development which we see and which, as Alan uh, Posner said rightly, which is not only an Austrian phenomenon, there's the American, there's Trump, but there's Marine Le Pen, there's AfD, there's Orban, uh, uh, Hungary, uh, Poland, Poland and so on and so forth. So we have... It's a long list now. And it's in a very this, long yeah, list. There's yeah. a very long list now with uh, right-wing population Populism. And so I think uh, what has been latent in the Austrian case now gets sort of uh, uh, embarked by this wave. Uh, there is now a European wave which brings the Aus Austrian potential sort of uh, to another sort of scaling effect. And I think what uh, then you can observe in Austria is not so distinctly different from what you see elsewhere, which is that there is a political class in the middle, the mm. moderate left, mm. the moderate mm. right, which is squeezed by two both ends, by the lefts and by the right. You see this in Germany, Grand Coalition. You see it basically in France, where you have uh, uh, President Hollande, who is forced by his left, but also by Marine Le Pen. It's the pattern for, for Finland, for Denmark, for Austria. So we are building up the, um, the margins of the political spectrums in all countries, and the political class is timid, mm -hmm. doesn't ca cannot react, does not want to react, and is basically um, building a wall around itself. And we've got Alan Posner saying this has got nothing to do with the 1920s or the 1930s, that people are living in a prosperous state. It's not like back then with mass uh, unemployment and so on and so forth. But people are comparing the situation with the 1920s and the 1930s. Very sane and sensible people are doing that in private conversations that I have in the media in general. Is there, what is there in this, this comparison? I, I would not agree with Alan on this because there is a situation that compares to the 1920s and if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I was hearing a story about income uh, discrepancies, for instance, in Austria and there was a report uh, sketching out very high income discrepancies in Austria like Piketty, uh, Thomas Piketty did it for whole Europe. Yeah. Um, so in Austria, like elsewhere, there are many rich people but many others who are poor and who did not benefit. So if you say that it's all wealthy and obviously, you know, I'm frequently in Vienna, it's a very 
wealthy town and uh, you can eat well and, and whatever, but it's not for everybody. And then if people feel scared about their own life perspective and they are in, uh, in anxiety about what they are going to lose in terms of social help and so on and so forth, you have the same phenomena of destabilization of the middle class, which is the phenomena to bring these people to the extreme right. Eva Koenig, I'd like to give you the last word on this round before we, before we move on. Something sinister in Austria. That word caught my attention. Something sinister. Do you mm. agree? Well, I do not agree with uh, some positions of Mr. Posner. Um, I think it's some sort of arrogant to say that uh, who cares about uh, small countries and the government of small countries. I have to say that uh, the Chancellor Helmut Kohl, he did care about the smaller countries and he did consult them or inform them. Uh, this is past, uh, this is not uh, done today. And uh, the second position that uh, Germany has the responsibility for the whole Europe. In fact, it is like this, um, Germany has the leadership for, for Europe and many um, countries or so the neighbor countries are glad about it, uh, that Germany takes the leadership. Uh, but you cannot say that uh, Germany has the responsibility. But what the you responsibility... appear to be saying is that yeah. Germany is bullying the smaller countries in Europe. Yes. You're nodding. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. But not really the smaller countries, because in the case of Austria, Austria was benefiting by sort of this uh, Germany, which uh, had the gains of the euro making and the whole thing. You can more talk about the European South, who was really uh, uh, starving about all this, you know, austerity policy. I think like countries like Austria or even the Netherlands more benefited from what, what Germany sort of was gaining through the single market. But on the political side, I agree with Mr. Koenig, which is that these countries resent that they have no more a say in the European making. And if you go to the refugee crisis for, and we see Mr. Feynman, the, form, the chancellor who just resigned, mm -hmm. and he was basically given order by, Mr. <coughs> by, by Angela Merkel to arrange this sort of European Schengen. But it was more sort of Angela calling for the Austrian chancellor to give him a task, as if these chancellors are not on an equal footing in the system of the European governance. And I think there is something building up, which in the small countries, uh, now we are seeing that we are paying a political price for this because the, the total sum of the smaller countries, they are powerful in the mm -hmm. sum. Yeah. OK, well, one thing we do know is that uh, in Austria, Norbert Hofer's success in the first round of voting shook the uh, country's uh, political establishment to the core. And uh, it led, as you just pointed out now, Ulrika, to the resignation of uh, the Chancellor, Werner Feynman. <laughs> The resignation of Austrian Chancellor Werner Feimann earlier this month sent a clear signal. And in Germany, the Social Democrats have seen a big drop over the past several years in their share of the vote and the number of party members. Chancellor Merkel's Christian Democrats aren't doing much better. Neither are many of Europe's other big political parties. Right-wing parties are stealing their votes. A lot of people are really nervous right now and they don't trust the established parties. And those parties are nervous too. We're talking about our existence here. We could end up in a tailspin and then crash. Are Europe's big political parties dying out? An interesting question, Alan. Uh, we're talking about the broad base, the big tent political parties that have been the cornerstone of European politics for, for, for decades now, since the Second World War, effectively. Are they on the way out now? It would appear so, and it's very alarming. Um, this is partly to do with, I mean, the basic reason for this is the electoral system in the whole of continental Europe. If you had an electoral system like in Britain, um, first past the post system, then you would still have, as in Britain, two main parties, centre-left, centre centre-right vying, uh, and, that's, and, and a basically stable uh, uh, political setup. Where they don't have that, where they have proportional representation in Great Britain for European elections, UKIP comes in on top. I mean, a, a, mm. a, a rag bag of well, basically fools. And, and, and this is what's happening in, in, in Europe. It's, it's proportional representation which is at the basis of this. Anyone who has a grudge for any reason whatsoever, and mostly it's baseless. Okay, it's true. There's a lot of 
income in, in inequality. Okay, it's true. There was a, the, the, the elites discredited themselves in the financial crash, crash of 2008. Okay, it's true that they make mistakes. But the fact is that what is going on here is that people are voting irresponsibly. They're simply saying, I don't agree with the system, I'm going to vote for so-and-so. They're not voting for a government, they're voting for <laughs> protest parties. Yes, this exactly. is a, a breakdown no. of political education. I, I would disagree, strongly disagree. I mean, people vote for what they vote for, and that's their right. Um, the, the voting well, unfortunately, right, uh, so that's the right. We've got the wrong first, system. First, your comparison doesn't hold, because in France you do have a majority system, and still there's Marine Le Pen. You do not see her in deputies, because there's a majority system, so she she doesn't hold deputy places in the Assemblée Nationale, but she holds 40%, 30 to 40% in some of the regions of France. So the voting system is just part of the explanation, and for France, it's no explanation. And the second thing is, it's the right for people to be in anger against the government, and it may not say that the people are voting wrongly or do, making wrong choices. It may say that the political class is not functioning and does do wrong politics. And we did wrong politics and a lot of wrong politics during the Euro crisis. There was everything legal but not moral. There was socialization of bank debts. So, so basically there is a system which needs to take the blame that people are giving. And what we are seeing is just this protest of uh, sort of the people, let's call it the people, but in the way the people is the sovereign, they are protesting against the political class, be that Beppe Grillo, it's always this, you know, establishment, but the establishment left the people behind. So instead of pointing to the people that the people are doing wrong choices, perhaps the establishment <coughs> could understand that they better do good governance for the people. If the, thing is, the thing is, uh, the more you want people not to vote uh, the right-wing parties, uh, those people who want really to protest, they know what to vote because they want to hurt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, but this is, okay, but the whole point about democracy is, is uh, and it's not taught correctly in school, they say democracy means um, uh, leadership by the rule by the people. That's not true. Democ liberal democracy means check on the checks on the rules of the I people, agree. checks on the agree. on the emotions of the populace. This is why you have the voting system uh, in Great Britain and the United States, which is designed to keep protest voters to a minimum. Com Completely agreed, completely agreed that the majority of the street is no democracy and the majority of the right. street can fail. Huh? That's agreed. But the thing is that European populism, including the Austrian one, comes always on two legs because you need two legs to walk. Yeah? Uh -huh. One is this Euro, uh, anti-Euro uh, side, the other is the ra racism, xenophobia. And because racism and xenophobia can be so easily criticized by the political establishment, look how these people are, you know, they are xenophobic, you do not need to talk to them, so they can be, you know, shifted away. But this basically enab en uh, enables the political class to not look at the real con critique of these people against a misfunctioning and st structural, fi uh, uh, structural flaws of, say, the Euro governance. Look, Bernd Lucke, AfD, but for Austria, I think that's pretty true. Um, there, are, there is a fundamental, substantial critique to make, which also comes from science, that the Euro governance system is flawed for many people and that it does not work. There's no social component, <coughs> no democratic component. If Marine Le Pen says this, she's a populist, but in essence she's right and she says what most of the mm. German social sciences say. So the problem is only because Marine Le Pen in addition says that she's xenophobe or anti-Semite or so, you can so easily push her away and that enables you to not take serious a serious point of critiques. And so I think we should look at what the populists are saying us. They are saying us we are mistreating people on many levels of the social and democracy field, so we should rather listen than to push them away. I just wonder, Alan, whether you are taking the voters seriously, because, you know, there are many people, clearly, what we are learning, and it's a learning process with the emergence of the far right in Europe, we're learning that there are a lot of people who are very threatened, disgruntled by the, by the ever accelerating speed of globalisation. This is what they tell us. They feel as though their traditional lifestyles are threatened. Do you respect that? Do you have sympathy for that? Or do you dismiss that? Um... <laughs> Well, I mean, you're putting me on the spot here, aren't you? No, I don't have any respect for that. Why should I respect someone who doesn't want his uh, society to be modern? Why should I respect someone who, who, who sort of says, uh, I, I want to live in a, in, a, in a racially pure society and I don't want any immigrants in here? Why should I <coughs> respect someone who doesn't want to share their wealth with other people? I have no respect for that, no. And the problem is not that the, that the parties are ruling. 
push this aside. They, they didn't get up and tell the people, you know, uh, this is not how we talk about strangers. This is not how we talk about globalization. This is not how we talk about Europe. But they they weren't angry enough. You're... They said, oh, well, we have to take your, your, uh, we have to take you seriously. And then they didn't. Ellen, you are picking up precisely what I was trying to explain. We are picking up these people on their racist and xenophobia tendencies, but we are not picking up their legitimate claim that the global economy is basically making them starve. It is not and, making and, and, anyone so starve can, in so Austria you, or Germany. Look, if, we it was, went, if it's Greece, fine. I mean, I, I'm in fa I, I have every sympathy with, with downtrodden Greeks, but there are no downtrodden Austrians, to be quite frank. They're swimming on the top. Let, let okay, me but, 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 but let's just, we'll come back to you immediately after. We're going to have a look at another short report, <laughs> and this one is an, an aspect of what we're discussing here is, is uh, the fears that people have about, what's the word, identity. And perhaps, we'll come back to it in just a second, <laughs> perhaps loss of identity. Let's watch the pictures first. Homeland. Across Europe, right-wing political parties are playing up nationalist themes including what they see as too much immigration. Now, the split is not between the left and the right, but between the globalists and the patriots, the globalists who favor the dissolution of France in a global magma, and the patriots who believe that the national arena is the most protective for the French, and that means for all of you. The National Front has become the voice of a lot of frustrated voters. There are many of these parties in Europe. Germany, too. We're patriots, we love our homeland, and we want to protect it. But can this new nationalism protect people from truly global problems? That is the question, a Valkyrie, globalists versus patriots. I think it uh, need not uh, be a contradiction. You can be a patriot, but uh, also uh, fond of globalization. Um, there is a special aspect uh, on the European level, especially for the Austrians. Uh, most people forget it. Um, in the year 2000, we had uh, the first break of the Grand Coalition. It was a coalition of the Conservative Party with the FPÖ, not with Jörg Haider himself, but mm -hmm. with the FPÖ. And uh, it was uh, some sort of maximum penalty uh, from the EU side mm -hmm. um, on suspicion without being asked, the Austrians without being asked. So the Austrians and, weren't consulted? Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is still a scar. Mm -hmm. This is still it's hurting. Wound, and the saying. Austrians uh, had the, uh, then the, the highest rate of... Um, <coughs> of um, um, Mm -hmm. uh, agreement. Agreement yeah, in, in entering the EU. Yeah. Uh, but after these so called EU sanctions, mm. it, it, uh, it's a problem. It's still a scar. A scar on the far right, resentment. Yeah? Uh, it's there. Well, what well, is the best way to stop it? What is the best way to address it? <clears throat> well, look. The Austrians elected a self-hating homosexual, an Israel hater, um, uh, and, and a, a hater of everything truly Western. And, and now they say there's a scar because the European Union decided that they couldn't allow that, that had something had to be done about that, that this wasn't the way we do business in Europe. Well, all I can say is tough luck for them, that we don't elect people like Jörg Haider uh, to be... Uh, uh, to be part of government, and we shouldn't allow this. It's in fact. How do we, we stop we, the far right? How do we stop I, I the far we, right? We need to get the analysis clear. The analysis is that uh, talking this uh, what Marie Le Pen said is basically globalism comes together with an agenda of opening. So she says she wants closure, but you cannot have closure just on one side. Either you have open markets, but then you get the com cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism with it, mm -hmm. or you want closure, but then you don't have open markets. And this is what we need to understand. The moment the liberal like Alan Posner, once open markets, the open agenda in terms of who you get other people in from different nations comes also. You cannot have two liberalisms separated. And that's the cleavage here, because the left wants closed markets, but an open sort of human agenda, and the right want only uh, 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 open markets, but they want to disclose this identity field. And because these two liberalism always come along, the left and the right
candidate are basically self-betraying their own electorates, and that goes to the margins. And this is what we see. So this is the analysis. How can that's we... an analysis of not not of a solution. That's an analysis but of the it's, problem. It's very important to get the analysis right. Which okay, is we've got the analysis. We... If I turn, I, it, how I... do you stop the far right? Um, I think we cannot stop it by order. Mm -hmm. We have to live with them and uh, we have to make the reality check if they have uh, some responsibility in a government. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, I hope so, the demystification and uh, you, you cannot stop it <coughs> by the media. The genie of nationalism is out of the bottle. Yeah. And Can it be put back in the bottle? Or is this going to run and run? Well, it remains to be seen, but I mean, the thing is, you have to fight it, and that's not what the what the uh, what, what the centre right is doing now. At the moment, they're saying we have to take people's uh, concerns seriously, and so on. They're pretending that these are real concerns. They're not real concerns. They're uh, they're demagoguery, and th this has to of be course, fought yeah. in that way. <clears throat> But the demagogy can only work because the uh, social and economic erosion is there. If not, it could not work like this. So the political class needs to fight that social and democratic erosion. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. I hope we've given you plenty of food for thought on this week's Quadriga. If you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, come back next week. We'd love to hear from you in the meantime as well if you want to share your views with us. Bye-bye. Tschüss. -bye. <laughs>